Okay, yes, of course, we are going to read chapter five and six today. Remember, they're at the pastry shop now. I've been excited at the thought of the pastry shop. There's no such thing in Kadami, but I knew about sweet cakes because Marcos's uncle had bought some when he'd come to visit his family. Marcos said he'd never eaten anything like those cakes in his whole life. He said they stuck to his teeth, but in a nice way. I wasn't silly enough to expect Grandfather to buy me one, of course, but I suppose there was a lurking hope at the back of my mind. As it was, I didn't even have time to take a proper look in through the door. All I got was a glimpse of a shiny floor, some metal chairs and a table, and a glass counter with piles of yellow, brown and white cakes on shelves underneath. It wasn't the happiness pastry shop that Grandfather wanted to visit after all, but the building beside it. This was high, with shops on the ground floor and four stories above. Grandfather pushed open a door at the side and began to walk slowly up the staircase. When the door clanged shut behind us, I'll admit right now that my nerves were tingling. I'd never been in a place like this before. As a matter of fact, I wasn't exactly used to stairs. In Kadami, even our, sh our school was all on one floor. I followed Grandfather up step by step, going as slowly as he did. On every landing, there were doors off to the left and the right, and Grandfather stopped, gasping for breath, pointing to one of the plaques on them to make me read them out to him. They were all in English, but he's better at reading. I'm Herrick. Blue Nile Insurance, I spelled out. Guy on export. Lion trading. Every time Grandfather shook his head, sighed and plodded on upward. At last we came to a door that just said Ethiopian Sports Company. And when I read it out to him, Grandfather gave a grunt of triumph that turned into a cough. I can tell you, if you're interested, that we'd climbed 69 steps. I looked round and saw that he was holding onto the banister and his face had that grey look on it again. There was nothing I could do, so I just waited until he had stopped panting. Is this it, Grandfather? Are you all right? He didn't answer, but he reached out for my shoulder and, leaning on me, walked a few steps to the door. It opened just before we reached it, and a smart young woman in a red dress came rushing out, a handbag swinging from her shoulder. She clattered off down the stairs in her high-heeled shoes. Even though she'd barely glanced at me, she'd made me feel like a worm. I was horribly conscious of my bare feet and crumpled shirt and stained old shorts. I think that just for once, Grandfather must have guessed how I was feeling, because he squeezed my elbow and he said, City girls, hey Solomon, they all think they're the Queen of Sheba. Then he squared his shoulders and marched me into the office. It took a while for him to explain himself, and we had we had to put up with quite a few stares and raised eyebrows from the five people sitting behind desks who were reading piles of papers or clattering away on keyboards or staring into screens or talking on telephones. It was then that I heard Atua Illuma's name for the first time. At last, though, they waved us towards a bench on the side of the room. I still hadn't got any idea of what Grandfather wanted or why he'd come to this place, and as we sat and waited on and on, I started to wonder if Grandfather had any idea either. Old people did get mixed up things sometimes, I know. Perhaps we'd come all this way to Addis for some crazy reason after all. I should have had some more faith in my wily old grandfather, because at last a door at the end of the room opened and a man came out. He looked at us without smiling. He seemed a bit cautious, as if he was afraid that we'd turn out to be a nuisance. He was about the same age as Abba and Cousin Wandu. I, I know that now, but he looked much younger and he couldn't have been more different. He was wearing a brilliant white shirt and a blue tie, and his shoes were shiny with polish. His hands were smooth, not a bit like Abba's powerful, rough working hands, and he had a big gold ring on his finger. I could see a silver-coloured watch too, poking out from beneath his shirt sleeve. So you Atto Demisi, are you? he said, frowning. He looked down at me. Did this boy bring you here? You can go now, son and he started feeling in his pocket for a coin. Grandfather was still struggling to get up from the bench, and the effort was making him mutter irritably. 
This is my grandson, Solomon, he wheezed out. Are you really Elemu, Petros' son? The man frowned. The man frowned deeply. He nodded curtly. You'd better come into my office. He led us across the room with, eye, with the eyes of all the people behind their desks following us curiously and in through the door of his office, which he closed behind us. Gosh, we're going to end on that cliffhanger here, Falls. I shall see you later for Chapter 6.